gold and clothing and silver. And he sent a little entourage, a group of soldiers with him. And they went to the king of Israel and they brought a letter. And the letter said, uh, I sent this letter with Naaman my servant so that you could heal him of his leprosy. And the king said, why did he send him to me? He's trying to start a war. I can't heal anybody of leprosy. And soon Elisha heard what had happened and Naaman was then sent to Elisha's house. And Elisha didn't even come out to him. He sent a message to him and it said, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you will be clean. Your flesh will be clean. Your leprosy will be healed. Well the Jordan River is not a very big river. I can throw a rock across the Jordan River. The water sometimes the year it's muddy, full of mosquitoes and, and weeds and moss. And he thought, why would you tell me I've got to wash in the Jordan seven times? Have you ever had to take a bath? You got brothers and sisters and your mother fills the bath and you take bath in turn. You had to share the bath water. Oh, yeah, I said, I know, me too. Now uh, it's not as bad. But I, I was the youngest. I was always the last one. I had to take a bath in my brother's dirty bath water. I thought that's no fun. Some of you come from a big family. One of you has to take a bath after two or three others have taken a bath. And you go, oh man, you get a little ring around the tub when you get in it. If someone tells you take a bath, what are they saying to you? If you're dirty. What if they tell you you got to take a bath seven times? You're real dirty. What if they tell you you got to take a bath seven times in a muddy river? You're real dirty. So Naaman was mad. He said, what does he think I am? Go wash in that dirty river seven times? You think I'm that bad? Naaman was marching off home angry and his servants came up to him and said, now master, you're just going home to die of leprosy. You can't hug your wife or children. You're isolated. Uh, maybe you should try it. What have you got to lose? There's a Jordan River right here. See, he had to ride by the Jordan River to get back to Syria. And he said, all right. So he got off of his uh, chariot and he took off his armor. He, he listened to his servants. He went down in the water and he dipped himself one time. Did he get a blessing? Two times. Was he clean yet? Why not? Water's water, right? Three times, four times. Was his leprosy still there? What difference does it make? Four times, five times. Because it's obeying the word of God brings the blessing. When God says he blesses the seventh day and you say, well, I'm going to keep the third day, are you going to get the blessing? God means what he says. When God says to Jericho, march around the city seven times on the seventh day and then you're going to get the victory, you can't say, I'm going to march around the city two times on the third day. You're disobeying God. God means what he says. Naaman went down five times, six times. He looked at his friend and said, this is humiliating. I'm getting out. They said, one more time. He got down one more time. He came back up and he felt something happen. All of a sudden, little missing fingers from his leprosy and sores, he felt them begin to heal. And the toes and fingers were popping back into place. And the Bible says, his flesh came to him again like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. This is a symbol for baptism because when you're baptized it's like being born again. That's why, <laughs> can you imagine a general? Here's a general, big tough strong general. It says he's got flesh like a baby. And I can imagine the soldier saying, praise the Lord, Captain Naaman, you've been cleansed. Can I pinch your cheek please? It looks so soft. <laughs> I mean you got this big soldier with baby skin. This is what a, this is what a Christian is. You are a soldier but you're a child. Jesus said, unless you become converted like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now how does water wash away sin? Now this is a mystery. I need a couple of volunteers up here. Let me see here. Uh, you can come up, young lady. And let me go back around here. All right, you got some friends that are voting. Yeah, these are those, you, yeah, your friends want you. Come on, yeah. All right, come on up. Now, Got a couple things for you here. All right. Here we've got something that represents, you want to guess? Red. Well, that's the blood of Jesus. This is sin. This is our sins. You want to hold that? Matter of fact, I'm going to each give you, one of them it says they're on there, but just. It's a piece of paper. Just wrote sins on it. Find out what happens to our sins here. Sometimes it helps tear straight if you fold it both ways and then rip. Let's see if that works. 
Have you ever sinned? Yeah. What's your name? Peach. Peach? Page. Page. And? Jenna. 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 Pastor Doug is a little deaf because I ran a chainsaw <laughs> for several years. So you got to. Okay, we're going to share the sins evenly with you. All right, there we go. So, you ever sung that song, What Can Wash Away My Sins? You have? You know what? What's the answer? The blood of Jesus. And nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, if you take your sins and you put them in there, let's see what happens. Stir them around a little bit. You want to make sure they're baptized. Yeah, keep going. Look at that. What about you? You can put yours in there too and see what happens. <laughs> I know. You think, don't worry, it's not blood. It's food, food coloring. You're not going to, you're going to be okay. What? Isn't that amazing? It's gone. What happened to it? You got a few letters, <laughs> particles of letters in there. <laughs> when you confess your sins to Jesus and you're baptized, where did the sins go? They're not in your hand now. Can you ever put those back together again or they're gone now, huh? No. Once we are baptized and we confess our sins, he says he washes away our sins. We are cleansed. It tells us in Revelation, the righteous have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How could something be made white in blood? We well, saw the other day, you remember when you put uh, some of that special chemical, the red went away and it turned white? And so the Lord can do that through the blood of Jesus. Thank you very much. You can go back to your seats. I don't think you want to take that with you. So Naaman came out of the water. He could go back home and rejoice. He could be with his wife. He could talk to the people in the city. He was so happy now. You know what Naaman did after he had his leprosy washed away? He went back to Elisha the prophet to thank him. And he wanted to give him a gift. He was so thankful that all of his leprosy had been washed away and Jesus can wash away your sins and give you eternal life. Now does it matter how we are baptized? You know, there's a lot of different churches baptized different ways. Some baptize by sprinkling, and some baptize by immersion, and some baptize by pouring. Some churches baptize by putting rose petals on you. Some churches baptize by putting your head in the water three times. Sometimes it's you're sprinkled with a shell of water as a baby. Some churches baptize by um, salt. They pour salt on you. Some just speak words over the phone. That's what you call the dry cleaning method. <laughs> but they got all these different churches have these different methods. But how many different ways of baptizing are there? What does the Bible say? There is one Lord, you say it with me, one faith. You guys read that? One baptism. There's one true biblical method you can see through the Bible for how people were baptized. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan and immediately coming up out of the water. Was Jesus sprinkled? Or was he immersed? You know what immersed means? It means he went down and he came back up again. And it says he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. You can read in John chapter 3 verse 23 when John the Baptist was baptizing. It says John also baptized in Anon near Salim. Salim means peace because it was a wide spot in the river where the water was calm and peaceful because there was much water there. Now if the Bible method for baptism is sprinkling or spraying or pouring, why did John need a river? See, the way that God tells us to do something is very important. The Greek word baptizo, when you read the word baptizo, it simply means to dip, to immerse, to plunge underwater, to submerge. I heard about a pastor. You all know what the Lord's Supper is, right? When you have communion. And what do we use for the symbols in communion? The bread represents what? The body of Jesus. And the grape juice represents? The blood of Jesus. Is it real blood? Is it real? Is it his real physical body? They're symbols. Since they're just symbols, is it okay instead of using grape juice, can I use 7-Up? Uh, because Jesus told us what to use. You know, I heard about a pastor, he said, well, we're going to have a communion service in our church, and since we know that the bread and the grape juice are just symbols, instead of bread and grape juice, we're going to have Coca-Cola and hamburgers. 
<laughs> and we're going to call that, that's what you call, that's sacrilegious. We're going to call that communion. Is that appropriate? So when God tells us to do something a certain way, does He want us to follow what the Bible truth is on those subjects? What is the Bible method for baptism? You know, sometimes a person gets baptized and they just get uh, sprinkled a little bit. That's not baptism. Or they sprinkle people that are babies and a baby is not really old enough to know what is happening. There's another example in the Bible. Philip the evangelist was told by the Holy Spirit to go down on the road towards Gaza, out in the desert. And while he was going down that road, he ran into uh, an Ethiopian treasurer who was the treasurer for Queen Candace, who was riding along in his chariot and he was reading from the prophecies. Philip was told, go near the chariot. He's the first hitchhiker in the Bible. And he said to the man, do you know what you're reading? He said, well, how can I know unless someone guide me? Would you like to come up in my chariot with me? So they rode along. He was reading a prophecy from Isaiah about Jesus. Philip started to preach to him and say, this is talking about Jesus the Messiah. He came. He died a few weeks ago. And um, he's the one that we've been waiting for. And the man said, this is wonderful news and I accept it and I believe. And he wanted to know, can I be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart. He said, there's water here. So he might have been pointing at the ocean because they were driving down by the ocean or it could have been an oasis. So notice what it says in the Bible. They went down into the water and when they had come up out of the water, Philip suddenly disappeared and found himself walking down the road towards Caesarea. That's the first example of somebody being beamed in the Bible from one place to another. This Philip was brought to this man just so he could hear the truth and be baptized. And as soon as he was baptized, it was so important that he stay with him until he was baptized. He then took the gospel down to the whole country of Ethiopia. Then Philip disappeared. He went preaching somewhere else. But it says they went down into the water together. They came up out of the water. A lot of churches have lost the significance of why this uh, symbol and the type and the method of baptism is so important. What other important symbol does baptism represent? He said, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm working real hard, especially if I'm working on cars and I get a little dirty and sweaty and greasy and it's so nice at the end of the day to come in and take a shower and to wash all the dust and the dirt off and feel clean. Baptism gives you that feeling of being clean from your sins. No matter what you've done, when a person repents of their sins and they confess their sins and they're baptized, they can get a whole new beginning. And you know what the promise is? And when you are baptized, it says, you shall receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. When did Jesus do His first miracle? Before His baptism or after? After. Jesus did no miracles that we know of before His baptism. He started His ministry. You know the Bible promise in Acts chapter 2? Peter said, listen carefully, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift. Does God want to give you a gift? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is unto you and your children and as many as the Lord God shall call. He not only wants to give you a gift, He wants to give you gifts of the Spirit. Okay, I need um, a volunteer. We, we had a girl this time. We're going to get a boy this time. Let me come over here and see. All right, you, you're coming over here. Now, Pastor Doug has had a, uh, a habit and a practice. And I'll tell you the truth, I'm not sure where we're going to find this here. Why don't we look in here together? Why don't you grab that box? You got to get a good hold on it. There we go. All right, we're good. So, I've had a practice for years of collecting Swiss Army knives. And this is, you know, this is called the champion knife. And, uh, for years I carried this with me, literally years. I always had this on my belt. But the problem is, after 9-11, I lost several of them because I forgot to take them off my belt. And when I went through airport security, they said, we got to take that from you. And they took my knife. So now I pack it in my bag. But it's got pliers on it. 
It's got two knives. You know what's really nifty? It's got, of course, tweezers. I use these. You pull out splinters. Has a uh, toothpick. I actually use this. You want to try it? No, oh, okay. <laughs> and you can sign a million dollar check with that pen that's on there. It's got a pen on it. You know what it has that most people don't know about? It also has a pin that is hidden, a little needle down in here. It's got just about everything. So one day, you know, I don't have too many collections. Pastor Doug is, you know, I try to be pretty thrifty, but you know, I couldn't help myself. And I bought myself a Christmas present. Go ahead, sit down here with me for a second. What's your name? Drew. Drew? Oh, you're going to be glad you got called. You know what this is? This is a Swiss Army knife. But it is called the monster of all knives. It's the big daddy of all Swiss Army knives. It's not very practical to keep in your pocket. <laughs> but, I mean, it's got a light on it. It's got a, a compass. It's got a clock. I haven't activated it yet. It's got uh, all these tools. See that? You can change your tools, and here's all the different fittings that go on the tools. Got about four or five knives. If you want to start a fire, magnifying glass. Or if you need to see that splinter that you got to get out, pliers wire cutters. Ah, I like them so much. These things are great. It's got, of course, a toothpick. Can you tell? It's got a boring tool. It's got just about anything you can put on a Swiss Army knife is on there. When you come to the Lord, He promises to give you gifts of the Spirit. Not just a gift, but gifts of the Spirit. And there are all kinds of different things that you can do you don't even know. But when He gives you the Holy Spirit, you look at the list of the gifts of the Spirit you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and other places in the Bible. And there's so many things that you have no idea you could do. I didn't know I could even play the guitar until after I was baptized. Uh, and I didn't know I could get up in front of people and teach. There's a lot of things I had no idea. But God starts giving you gifts. And as you use them, you get more gifts. If it's okay with your parents, I'll let you keep the baby. Is that okay? Let's give him a hand. You know, the most important decision a young person can make is that decision to follow Jesus and begin that amazing adventure to eternity. That's why we're so excited to tell you about the new amazing adventure programs that are available. During these nearly 10 hours of exciting high-definition programs, the young people will do science experiments, learn about history, nature, encounter some wild animals, and most of all, they'll learn about Jesus from the Word of God. There's a beautifully illustrated Bible study guide to go along with each of the video presentations. These beautiful illustrated study guides are full of pictures and puzzles and Bible stories. They'll lead your kids through an incredible journey with Jesus. And for me, the most exciting thing is this new Amazing Adventure series goes along with the Amazing Facts Adventure Bible. The Bible, the study guides, the DVDs are all designed to lead your young person on a journey for life with Jesus. Call the number on your screen or contact us at afbookstore.com. Not only do you get gifts of the Spirit, the Bible says that it's like a marriage. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The Bible says the church is like the bride of Christ. In order for two people to be husband and wife, what do they have to do? Get married? They call that a what? A wedding. Baptism is as important to a Christian as a wedding is to a marriage. A wedding is the ceremony by which a man and woman are united. They become one. Baptism is like you're being married to Christ. Now, is it something that you would do publicly? Girls, I want to ask you a question. If you had a boy, he was dating you. Now, of course, is when you get older. And he said, uh, I love you and I want to marry you, but I don't want to tell anybody. Would you want to marry him? You think, what, he's ashamed of me? Or if he said, I love you, I want to marry you, but let's do it secretly. When you get baptized, you notice baptisms are usually public? Do you know when Jesus called people, he did it publicly in front of everybody. Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew. He said, come follow me. Come follow me. If you're going to choose to follow Jesus, don't be ashamed of him. 
If a husband is ashamed of his wife, she's not going to want to marry him, and vice versa. What else does baptism represent, and why does it matter? The Bible says that we are buried with him through baptism. So um, when a person is baptized and they're put under the water just for a moment, and then you bring them back up again, it's like that they've been buried and now they're being resurrected. You've probably seen, a, a, well, maybe you haven't seen it, but you know when a baby's born, before a baby's born, it's inside the mommy and it's floating around, it's swimming in the water. And <laughs> when that water breaks, it means the baby's coming. A baby comes out of the water, takes its first breath. You've probably seen stories where, you know, a baby's born, it comes out, it's not breathing, so the doctor holds the baby up and gives him a little swat on the posterior. You all know what the posterior is. And the baby goes, <laughs> and then everybody is so happy, <gasps> the baby's crying. You know, when you're born again and you repent of your sins, sometimes with a new birth there's a little bit of tears. But that God and His angels smile. The Bible says, weep, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. Then you have the joy. There might be weeping in the night and joy comes in the morning. So it's a burial. Now if your parents tell you, look, you know you live on a ranch sometimes, they used to say, take the trash out back and bury it. They give you a back, they give you a bag of garbage and you take it out back and you drop it on the ground and you pick up some dirt and you sprinkle it on top and you come back and they say, did you bury the trash? I buried it. Next day the raccoons got into the trash. It spread all over the farm. And parents said, you said you buried it. They said, well I sprinkled some dirt on it. Same thing. <laughs> I said, you didn't bury it. Some people say, well sprinkling is the same as a person being immersed. It's not the same thing. Being immersed means you're plunged under, you hold your breath for a moment. It's like death and you come out of the water. It's like a baby being born. It's a new birth. I did a baptism for a man and uh, I've seen other people do it too. And he said, Pastor Doug, when you baptize me, I want you to hold me under for just a moment. Usually pastor just puts you under and brings you right back up again. And he doesn't, don't have to hold him under long. And, uh, but one man said, you know, while I'm under, I said, I'm a good swimmer. He said, I want to, I'm going to have a prayer. So if you could just hold me under there and I'll then squeeze your hand when I'm ready to come back up. I said, you sure? He said, no, I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. He says, I just, it's a very important occasion to me and so when you put me under, uh, I'll, I'll hold you down. Well, I did that and it went fine but I heard about another pastor. He did that to a gentleman, a Spanish gentleman in Northern California. He was getting baptized in a lake and his family was all gathered on the shore and he, just when they got out in the water, he said, now hold me under until I squeeze your hand and then bring me up again because I want to pray while I'm under. The pastor said, okay. But the family didn't know. So he took the man, he said, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he put him under. <laughs> and he just held him there. And the man looked like he was okay. And the family started, uh, he's trying to drown him, you know. <laughs> They're getting ready to charge him. He squeezed his hand, he brought him back up again. But it represents, you come and take up, <gasps> you take that breath. And it represents like a baby being born. It's a new life. The Bible says that even so we should walk in what? a newness of life because we are resurrected with the Lord. Heard an interesting story in history about someone named Henry Box Brown. He was a slave. You know that story? Yeah, in like 1813 he was born, 33 years of age. He was having a very rough time working for a terrible taskmaster. Uh, he had a wife and children and without even telling them his master sold his wife and children to someone else. And he said, boy, enough is enough. And he got a friend and he said, I want you to build me a box, two feet by two feet by three feet, put a little water in it, a little bit of padding, I'll drill a little hole for air, and I'll take a couple biscuits with me, and nail me in the box and ship me to Philadelphia where there are some people who are helping to rescue slaves. Ship me to this address. So his friend did that. Now he had marked on the box this side up. He didn't want to get turned upside down. This side up was put all over the box, but he went in a wagon, he went in a train, he went in another wagon, he had bounced down the road and they ignored the sign. At one point they put him upside down but he couldn't utter a word and it was hot and he could barely breathe and he was painful. 27 hours he was in that box. Finally they delivered it to the Quakers in Philadelphia who set him free 
and he spent the rest of his life trying to help other people get free. When you have been baptized and you've been delivered from sin, you want to help other people be free. Amen? So do I need to join a church when I'm baptized? Or can I just say, I'm going to get baptized and I'm sort of going to be a maverick Christian. I'll just go out there on my own. And just me and the Lord, I don't need anybody. I don't want to go to a church because there's difficult people in church. Is that how you're supposed to do it? The Bible says, by one spirit we are baptized into one body. Do you need to be part of that body? Baptism is the ceremony by which you become part of the body of Christ, the church. The Bible says He is the head of the body. Colossians 1.18, the church. We are baptized into Christ. So when someone says, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, there's something wrong with that. Now if they're sick and they can't go, or if they're so far away there's no church, but if someone says, I'm just going to be a finger out there by myself or an ear out there by myself, they will not last very long. All the different parts of the body work together. We need to be connected. Amen? The Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. God wants us to all be part of the church. Who's being saved? Those added to the body of Christ. Christ's body is His temple. We all are different parts of the body. Some of us are the mouth, some are the eyes, some are the ears, some are the brain, some are the feet, some are the hands. But we all work together with our different spiritual gifts. When you're baptized, God gives you some of those gifts. Can you be too bad to be saved? What do you think? No. You're not a worse sinner than God is a Savior. Did God save liars in the Bible? Did God save thieves? The thief on the cross. Did God save murderers? Moses killed somebody. David murdered somebody. People who committed adultery like David and others. God is very merciful. So don't think I'm too bad for God, that I've sinned too much. You know, God is all powerful and He can forgive your sins. How do we receive that forgiveness? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. The Lord will cleanse you. And the promise is, the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Will Jesus cast out anyone who comes to him for forgiveness? Can you think of anybody in the Bible that came to Jesus for forgiveness and he sent them away? Everybody who came. Lepers said, Lord, I'm full of leprosy, but if you want, you can make me clean. Jesus said, I want to. He touched him and he cleansed him. Blind man said, Lord, if you want to, you can open my eyes. He said, I want to. He touched him, opened his eyes. The Lord unstopped deaf ears. The Lord healed all kinds of things when people came to him because they had a need. So how do I know when I'm ready to be baptized? Well, is there a specific age? How old was Jesus when he went with Joseph to the temple and Mary? Twelve. You know, that doesn't mean someone could be ready sooner, some are later, but as a general rule, I like to say that if you're old enough to be lost, you're probably old enough to be saved. Actually, I'm quoting James White when I say that. You know, if you have your own personal devotions, and if you're spending time with the Lord, if you understand the main teachings, if you make a decision to follow Jesus, do you love God? Have you invited Jesus into your heart? And you know, here's the big one. Are you willing to give up your selfish ways of the world and to follow Jesus because you love Him? That's one of the most important things. All right, I need... Let me see here. All right, you, here. I need a big boy. That's a, this one, sorry. Okay. All right. Let me show you something here. Know what that is? It's a jar. It's a jar. This is the, the devil. There we go. That's the world. Now, I can barely get my hand in here. Ugh and I can get my hand out. 
But if I try to get a hold of the world, want to take that off my hand? Ah! <laughs> I'm going to file a workman's comp claim for that. <laughs> Whew, you can't come off. If I'm trying to hang on to this, let's see how it works with you. All right, Pastor Ross, you want to play your part here? So you like some things in the world? The Bible says, love not the world or the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, you know, put your hand in there. Get a hold of that. Make a fist. You got to make a fist. All right. There we go. So what you got here is you're saying, I want the world, but the devil it uses the world to keep you from being free because we don't let go. Now, let go of the world for a second. Can you get your hand out now? So you'd be free. You, want, you know what they do in Africa? Pastor Ross is from South Africa. They catch monkeys by taking a coconut shell. They put a little hole in it. They chain the coconut to the ground. They put the monkey's favorite food inside. It's usually a handful of nuts. The monkeys look around. They run up. They put their hand in there. They grab them. Go ahead. Go in there. Grab, grab the uh, world, yeah. And then the, the trappers come, and the monkey tries to get away, but the monkey's not smart enough to let go. And so the trapper gets him, and the monkey becomes a slave. You can let go. If you want to get away, I'm going to give you a couple of worlds here anyway. Okay, let's give him a hand. What was your name? Luke. Good job, Luke. Here. You can have one of those. You've got to let go of the world. If we love the world and the things of the world, the television, the games, the food, the clothes. The devil tries to trap us with the sinful things of the world. We think, oh, but I've got to have it. As long as he can keep you with that and you don't let go of those things, Christ said, if you're going to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. But you'll be free. If you're trying to have the things of the world, what would you rather have? A uh, hundred dollars now or a million dollars in a week? if you're smart. But you know sometimes little children you say, do you want that one cookie now or do you want 12 cookies tomorrow? I say, I want the one cookie now. Right? What would you rather have? The pleasures of sin for this one life? Knowing that you're going to die and be lost, you can't even enjoy it. Or would you want eternal life? Yeah, this is what the devil, but so many people are saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to be saved so I want to give up on eternal life so I can have the pleasures of sin now. If a man came to you and he said, I'm going to give you a million dollars and a vacation for three months in Orlando and you can go to Epcot and Disney World and Universal Studios and it's the theme park city of the world. You can just go from one amusement park to another. It'll be like Vanity Fair. You can just have fun and games and rides and play and toys and million dollars and you say, wow, that sounds great. And then he says, yeah, and after, after the, the 90 days are over, uh, I'm tossing you in a lake of fire. Would you enjoy it? No. Uh, every time you went on the next ride, you'd say, oh, 29 more days, 28 more days. So, and you'd be thinking, you couldn't enjoy anything knowing that it wasn't going to end well. But if someone comes to you and they say, look, you need to carry this load, but at the end of the road when you're done, you're going to have eternal life. That load would seem so light because you think, I've got Jesus and eternal life in heaven, and it's so much easier to be a Christian than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. So how do you know you're ready to be baptized? Daily devotions? Do you pray and read your Bible every day? Have you repented of your sins and confessed them? Are you learning? to cheerfully do your work and chores as though you're doing them for Jesus? Do you understand the main teachings of the Bible? That would be in the baptismal vows. There's about a dozen baptismal vows where you understand the principal teachings. The Bible tells us what happened to Jesus when he was baptized is a symbol for what we can expect. Now when Jesus was baptized, what happened? The Bible says that he came up out of the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. Was Jesus baptized for his sin? Did Jesus ever sin? So why was Jesus baptized? An example for us, and you know Jesus was also baptized in behalf of those who cannot be. 
Christ came up out of the water, the heavens were open. When you're baptized, the heavens are open for you in a new way. He saw the Spirit descending. God's Spirit comes into your life. Gives you special power. It comes like what, what animal? Like a dove because it brings peace into your life. And then he heard a voice. You will hear God speak to you. And what does that voice say? You are now my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When you're baptized, what does God say? I am well pleased with you. I am happy with you. You are adopted into the family of God. He calls you his son or his daughter. Now you may make mistakes. Any of you have a pet dog or a cat? And uh, you pick him up as a puppy or a kitty. You bring him home. And you say, all right, you're now part of the family. But then the puppy makes a, a, he has a little digestive accident in the living room. And you say, oh, you stinking puppy. I'm taking you back to the pet store. Is that what you say? No. no, he's part of the family. You just clean it up and you try and teach him better. Or the cat gets on the curtains and starts to tear up the curtains and you say, you wicked little kitty. <laughs> I'm taking you back. Or you say, oh, you're part of the family. We're going to try and trim your claws a little bit and teach you not to do that. And so when you're adopted, God loves you more than you love a puppy or a kitty. And you are his child. And even if you make mistakes, once you've given your life to him and you said, I've been baptized, Lord. I've decided I want to follow you. I want to be a Christian. He gives you his Holy Spirit. Owls can be found practically everywhere except for Antarctica and most of Greenland. There are about 225 species of owls living today. Myth, folklore, and the popular culture of our day have associated the owl with prosperity and wisdom. Have you ever wanted more wisdom? Have you ever desired to have great understanding? Let's take a moment to learn how we can increase our wisdom and understanding. Please listen to these verses. With God is wisdom and strength, counsel and understanding are years. For the Lord that gives us wisdom and from his mouth that comes knowledge and understanding. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Wisdom is a tremendous blessing from God. Go to the Father of glory that he might give you the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Tots are here, and you don't want to miss worship. It's going to be an exciting day on the Tiny Top Farm. today? Well, what are you happy about? It's worship time. <gasps> oh, that makes me happy. I love worship. Me too. <laughs> Billy boy, do you like
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Wonderful Sabbath. Yes. Blessed Sabbath. Yes. And holy Sabbath. Yes. Amen to each one of you. There's a song that's been running through my head, and I'm sure that it has something to do with the weather. I played it and just wanted to recite some of the words to you. It says, there's sunshine in my soul today. Amen. And it, uh, the lyricist wrote, he says, there's sunshine in my soul today more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. No earthly sky can compare to it. It says, for Jesus is the light. Wow. And then the second verse says, there's music in my soul today. And those of you that love music, you know it's in your soul every day, all day. And if you don't love it, when you read a psalm, you're reading music. When you hear a hum, you, when you give a hum, there's music in my soul today. Uh -huh. A carol to my king. And of course, you're a king. I'm not going to be selfish. And Jesus is listening. He can hear the songs that it says I cannot sing, but the songs that we cannot sing. Yeah. 
Many times there are songs in our hearts and our minds and we don't even know what the melody is from. We don't know uh, which angel God dispatched to bring us that song and where it was in heaven and when you heard it, but there's music in your soul. And then the third stanza says, there's springtime in my soul today, amen? For when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart and the flowers of grace appear. As long as I've been playing that song, I didn't remember that particular stanza, but when I, when I read it and played it again this morning, even right here, I was just shouting hallelujah. You know, there's always something, I don't care how many times you go over the word of God, the hymns of God, there's always a part that you miss because you weren't ready to receive it at that time, or you were focused upon something else at that time. But when it says that the songs and the grace of God would be in those songs. One more stanza that's in this particular one. It says, there's gladness in my soul today. How many of you have gladness in your soul today? Happy to be here, happy to be living, happy to be able to move about. And those of you that can't move, happy that you're still here. Happy that you have a mind that can concentrate on God. Happy that you can think, that you can speak. And if you can't speak, happy that you can think through God. And he knows what you're saying, even if you can't utter it. Yeah. Just gladness in my soul today. And it says, and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now. And then what? For joys laid up above. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then the course kind of culminates it all. There's sunshine, blessed sunshine, where the peaceful moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face when he comes back, there will continue to be sunshine in our soul. Let's stand for prayer. And those of you that are at home, whatever the position is, if not, just listen in or utter your own prayer. For we are connecting with Jesus, and that sunshine is coming through our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you for the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything. And then we pray in a very special way that you would just continue to bless all of us. You know how to bring the sunshine in when it looks like it's dark. You know how to make the sun shine when we think that there may not be any. And so we thank you for Jesus the fact that he is the son of righteousness and that he died for each one of us. We pray for those that are sick and shut in, whether it's spiritual illness, physical, mental, morally, emotional, financial, yes. it doesn't matter. We ask that you would send your healing yes. hand, yes. touch each one of us where we belong, for we all have some sickness. The scripture says we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Mm -hmm. And so we ask that as you touch us, that you would take away that and allow the sun of righteousness to permeate our entire being so that when he comes in the clouds of glory, we not only will be caught up to meet him, but we will be happy and say, lo, this is our God. He has come to save us. Bless us to this end. We do pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us all say, amen. 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 You may be seated. Right before Elder Cherry comes to teach the lesson, and the song will be in your heart because he needs plenty of studying time, so just let it ring. The scriptures will ring out in the Psalms and all the different things. But we have a few announcements. The first one is if you're on the Sabbath School Council, we need to meet just briefly to decide what we're going to do for the graduates. Second announcement, next Sabbath, we're going to honor the graduates. Just mention you at Sabbath School, but in Divine Worship Hour, we want to say thank you for sticking with your educational situation. If you have not turned a name into uh, the office or myself or uh, to Elder Smith and turned it into MISPA, a graduate, then please do so. And then, of course, the 19th, we'll be doing uh, Father's Day. But what I really want to mention got me all excited. We're going to have Sabbath school outside. Weather permitting, Jesus saying the same on July 17th and August 14th. Amen. Now, you know how that is. If the weather doesn't permit one day, we're going to do another one because we need to get outside. We'll be in small groups. You'll be with your teacher or a teacher. It won't be a big group like we are here. So we're looking forward to that. And the other thing, and that's only two that are scheduled, let us know if you want more or just show up and we will get out there 
and under the sun, with the sun of righteousness directing us, we will have our small group Sabbath school. Amen. Now we have two picnic uh, plannings for this year, and it'll be right over there. We have plenty of space, and I already just talked to one of our major game leaders, G-A-M-E leader. We're gonna be all on the lot and so forth. The picnics will be on Sunday. The first one will be July 25th, and you'll see this on our website, and then also August the 22nd. So we're gonna let the sunshine flow through our souls, and then when all is said and done, our fellowship, our peace, our joy, our unity, our love will lead us from earth to glory. Amen. Elder Chair. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Amen. The Holy Ghost dropped the song in my heart this morning, Sister Turner. And we all know it, so I want your help. I do, I want your help. Let's repeat it. We don't have to sing it, okay? We're still working under a few restrictions, but we're going to come out the back side of that. But you all know this song. I'm going to start it off. I serve a risen what? He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hands of what? Mercy. I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. What does he do, everybody? He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow ways. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how. I know he lives. How do we know? He lives within my heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to go to that third voice, verse, but if I do, I might start shouting. And it's a little bit too early for that. What we want to do now is we want to get into our Sabbath school lesson. Just a brief review of our Sabbath school lesson. Holy Ghost, do what only you can do right now. Open up our hearts and our minds. Help us to re receive your message through this teaching today. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. Use me for your bidding. When everything is said and done, bless us that we can say what's good to have been at your feet for these few moments. For we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As it is my habit, I just want to share with you a few words of encouragement. I'm caught up on this top of things right now. Anybody know what a topper is? I know one person knows for sure. What's a topper? Anybody know? A topper is a small bite of explosive flavor, okay? I'm caught up on small bites of explosive flavor. Let me share this with you right quick. Holy Spirit dropped this in my spirit on, on Sunday as I began my study for the week. I have told you these things so that my joy, my delight, Joy and delight might be you in you, and that your joy may be full and complete and overflowing. Just the fact that he lives is a start off of that. Amen? Amen. We as Christians are not required to go about with long faces, sighing as though we had no Savior and no hope. This will not glorify God. He desires us to be cheerful. He desires us to be filled with praise to his name. He yes. desires us to carry light in our countenance and joy in our hearts. Yes. We have a hope that is far above any pleasures that the world can give. And this fact should be made noticeable. Huh? Yes. People should know by the way you look, by the way you carry yourself, by the way you go around, that there is something about you, and that something special is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why should not our joy be full, full, lacking nothing? We have an assurance that Jesus is our Savior and that we may draw freely from him. We, we, part we may partake freely of the rich provisions that he has made in his word. The joy of Christ is pure, absolute cheerfulness. 
It is not a cheap fund that leads to vanity or words of light, of lightness of conduct. No, we are to have a joy, and his greatest joy is to see his people obeying the truth. Amen. Plead with God, saying, I make my entire surrender, okay? I give myself away, then be joyful. The word is in you, purifying and cleansing your character. God does not want his children to go about with anxiety and sorrow expressed in their faces. He wants the lovely expression of his countenance to be revealed in every one of us who are partakers of his divine nature, for we have power to escape the corruption of the world. Okay? We are not left as a company of orphans. It is possible for us to obtain victory after victory and be the happiest people on the face of the earth. That's our small bite for today. Let's move into our Sabbath school lesson. Our Sabbath school lessons have been very rich and very rewarding for this past quarter. Today we want to take a brief look at the new covenant. We're going to take a brief look at the new covenant. What's old is new. And I'm going to need your help. Y'all got to help me do this now. In previous lessons, we learned that God established an everlasting covenant. Somebody tell me what an everlasting covenant is. When did it start? When did the everlasting covenant start? It started from the foundation of the world. So it started with God, okay? And when will the everlasting covenant end? Never. That's why it's called the everlasting covenant, huh? Why are we talking about this in this lesson? What is the difference between the covenant, the old and the new? Are they similar? Or are there major differences in them? Same author, same law, same relationship. Same purpose, better covenant, promises, better sacrifice, and priesthood. Let's wait in. But this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. What one word comes through all throughout the scripture? Hmm? I. And who is that I? God. Okay. The people of Israel had broken their covenant with God because of their unfaithfulness. Therefore, Jeremiah prophesies a new covenant between God and his people. However, there are elements that, that are the same as the new covenant. What was the problem with those people back then? Hmm? As you study, not this necessarily, but what was the problem with the children of Israel? Their unfaithfulness to the covenant. And what, else, what did they want to do? They wanted to be like everybody else around them. Is that not true? Amen. They didn't want Yahweh, praise his holy name, to dominate their lives and everything. They wanted gods of stone. They wanted gods of wood, okay? They wanted gods under trees. They wanted gods in groves, okay? They wanted to worship the sun, the moon, the water, okay? All of those things that the Egyptians got, and I started to say, so they got tore up about those were the things they wanted to worship. Can they be excused? Somewhat. I mean, after somebody pokes something in your brain for 400 years, it becomes a part of who you are and part of your habit, right? And that's what the Lord had to do. He had to break them of it. The new covenant is an updated covenant in some ways. It is a culmination of the first one, okay? God is the creator of the covenant. 
The law of God is the basis of the covenant. It is the basis of God's forgiveness and mercy. Thank him for his forgiveness and his mercy. I will betroth you to me in stability, in faithfulness. Then you will know, recognize, appreciate the Lord and respond with loving faithfulness. This is taken from Hosea 2.20, and this is from the Amplified Bible. The people of Israel had been unfaithful to God, but he wanted to renew their relationship. Who wanted to renew their relationship? He did. Okay? God, merciful and kind, but all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He could have done what? He could have done what to Israel? He could have wiped them out. He could have. He could have just wiped them off the face of the earth and create, gave that message to somebody else. These people represented God's who? His remnant. They were. They were his special chosen people to bring the message to the rest of the world at that time. Okay? But they just wouldn't apply it. That's what the new covenant is about. God wants to win our hearts again. He wants to renew our thoughts and feelings. Nevertheless, this is not a new purpose. It is the same relationship that God wanted to have with his people since the beginning. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now when we talk about the heart, what are we talking about? Mind. The mind. Okay, we're talking about the mind, and if it's in your mind, and if it's in your heart, it's a part of your total being. Amen? Heart works. At the moment in history when God plans his, plans his covenant for people were and, and are hampered by rebellion and unbelief, he sends prophets to proclaim the covenant history with his faithful with his faithful have not come to an end. No matter how unfaithful the people might have been, no matter the apostasy, rebellion, disobedience among us, the Lord still proclaims his willingness to enter a covenant relationship with all who are willing to repent, to obey, and to claim his promises. We each, praise God, have an individual opportunity to enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord. Now, when should that covenant be renewed? Huh? Come on. Every day. Every day. Every morning. And then before you go to bed at night. I will secure my covenant with the Lord. So if by chance he don't breathe on me the next morning and I have to remain asleep, at least I went to sleep knowing that I'm secure in him. All right. The same purpose. Let's take a brief look at this. Even then, I will, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house should be called, what everybody? A house of prayer for who? All nations. Okay? For all nations. God wanted to invite all nations to be part of his promise. What the Israelites failed to do by faith was point people in the direction where they could receive that promise and where it could be fulfilled, okay? That was the core of his covenant with Israel. The new covenant has the same purpose. The grace of God is available for anyone who wants, who wants it through the blood of Jesus, amen. The Jews also accepted, the Jews who accepted Jesus embraced this new covenant and built the foundation of the Christian church. Amen. 
Later, Gentiles from every nation joined the covenant and were grafted into the true people of God. And the Lord is still grafting. Amen? We have this special message that the Lord has given us contained in the book of Revelation and in particular Revelation 14 to let people know that the covenant still exists. You can live through this covenant okay. And at the end of everything, there is salvation. Old and new covenants. New covenant written upon one's heart is an individual choice. Did you get that? We have to let people know it is a individual choice, okay? You can't depend on deacon, can't depend on elder, can't depend on reverend, you can't, can't depend on doctor. It is a individual choice that you have to make. It is crucial that the person whom the new covenant is made and who will experience and stand within the new covenant relationship understands this choice. Your life is composed of your choices. Your servant to the choices you made. Your choices determine your destiny. Do I need to repeat that? No, your life is composed of your choices. Every choice you make, you got to serve. You do no matter how big or how small it is. But this is a humongous, everlasting choice. Even the Lord told me, I lay before you a choice between what? Life and death, blessing and cursing, and then he told us to do what? Choose life. All right? So that you can live, and so that your generations that follow you can live. Okay? So we have to make sure that we are making the right choices. The members of the New Covenant community are not every physical or blood descendant of Abraham, but every person who allows God to write the law inwardly. Now, we do still have people out there telling us that all this stuff was made for the Jews, don't we? Huh? As you witnessed? Still have people, ah, oh, this stuff was made for the Jews. It was made for the Hebrews. No, it wasn't. It was made for who? Man. For everybody. It was. It was made for everybody. And what the Lord is going to do is instead of it being on ten tables of stone like it was before, what does he do with it? Put it in your heart. Put it in your mind. And it is our responsibility that once it go in through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're allowed to do what? Come out. Okay? All right. Let me see, I lost my place now, so I'll go back to the beginning. The members of the New Covenant community are not every physical or blood descendant of Abraham, but every person who allows God to write his law inwardly, making it a part of the total will of the believer so that he or she may obey God by what, everybody? Faith. Therefore, the choice of allowing the law to be written upon the heart identifies that person as a member of God's spiritual Israel, where physical ancestry is irrelevant. Okay? So if anybody tell you this was for the Hebrews, this is for the Jews, tell them, no, 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 it ain't so. You can just wipe that off. You can't use that one. Come with another. Any person who allows God to do his work within him or her becomes a member of God's Israel, his true spiritual Israel. The true spiritual Israel who have experienced God's writing his law upon our hearts become partners with God, okay? Christ is mediating the new covenant. Who's mediating the new covenant? Christ. For all believers, no matter whether they are Jew or Gentile, black or white, yellow or brown, male or female, the law is both in both covenants is the same. Under the new covenant, the conditions by which eternal life may be gained are the same as under the old, what kind of agreement? Perfect agreement. 
when God does something, he doesn't do it good. He does it what kind of good? Very good. All right? So when he first put this thing in, for, in, in force and he moved it our way, okay, it was perfect, but something happened. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he also mediator of the better covenant, which is established on a better promise. That's our scripture text. The book of Hebrews explains how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. It also explains the difference between the two covenants. Why is the new covenant better than the old one? Anybody? Why is the new covenant better than the old one? Bible students? Okay. In your heart. Okay. So it don't start with just one group of people and it have to be spread out. Everybody's got access to it because it's, if you ask the Lord, he takes it and he does what with it? He pours it in your heart and in your mind, okay? So you had, so in other words, what you're saying to me is we had everything that we need to receive the covenant, to execute the covenant, to live the covenant. We got everything that we need. The old covenant uses, used symbols to explain salvation. And those symbols were what? What were some of those symbols? Huh? The people had to take what, where, and do what before they had forgiveness. Yep. Had to do all kind of stuff. I don't, I, I, those people are my heroes. I don't know if I'd have been, and you had to pray for forgiveness of sin every day? That means you had to have a group of doves or whatever just to go and ask for forgiveness of sin every day. You did. They're my heroes. I don't know if I'd been able to do that, at least not in my present state of mind, you know? So you don't know how you, what you'll do until you have to live it. The old covenant used symbols to explain salvation. In the new covenant, no symbols are needed because who died for our sins? Jesus died for our sin. Hallelujah. And intercedes on our behalf before the Father. So what is that saying to me? He made me. He saved me, he redeemed me, okay, and now he is my barrister. He is my attorney in heaven before the Father. That's a beautiful thing. But wait, there's more. Because what is he going to do next? He's coming back. So he's covering everything. He is. Salvation is the same in both covenants. But the old one was based on a future promise. The new covenant is based on a promise that Christ has already fulfilled. And when, he did, when did he fulfill it? When he died on the cross. That's right. Where did the fault lie with the failure of the old covenant? There it is right there. The problem with the old covenant was not the covenant itself because it was made perfect, but the failure of the people to grasp it by faith. Us humans always mess stuff up, don't we? Hmm? We're pretty good at that, ain't we? We are. We're pretty good at messing stuff up. Now, if somebody give you something that's perfect, all you got to do is remember to do what? Keep it perfect. Huh? Did you get that? If somebody gives you, if the Lord gives you something that's holy, all you got to do is look at it and remember to do what? Keep it holy. Huh? You ain't got to change nothing. Not if you got faith and you believe in God and you know he does things only good and very good and everything he does is perfect he give you something all you got to do is keep it right all you got to do is keep it holy all you got to do is keep it perfect 
Amen? All right, let's move forward so we can finish this up. Better sacrifices, better priesthood. Now, if I'm moving too fast, y'all slow me down now, you know, because I, 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 uh, Sabbath school is always better when there is that discussion going on. I love to teach, and the Lord has anointed me to do this, but I'm not a lecturer. I'm not. We have to do this together. He had, to serve, he had to be one of us so that he could serve God as our merciful and faithful high priest and sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus became one of us for that purpose. He didn't have to. He chose to. Amen? Praise God for that. The sacrifices of the old covenant could not actually cleanse the sins of the offer or sanctify them. However, the sacrifice of Christ in the new covenant can remove our sins and sanctify us. Amen? Amen. And how's that done? Huh? Somebody help me out. The process... Stay with the process, okay? And then we have to let the Holy Ghost do his work, right? Because the Holy Ghost is busy sanctifying us every day. Amen. Likewise, there were priests in the Old Covenant who were not perfect and had to be replaced by the following generations in the New, co in the new Covenant. Jesus is our high priest for how long, everybody? forever. The veil of the most holy place was torn when Jesus died. This incident marked the transition from symbols and types to reality, from the old covenant to the new one. Here's the last word. <laughs> Praise God. The new covenant is a greater, more complete, and better revelation of the plan of redemption. We who partake of it, partake of it by what, everybody? By faith. A faith that will manifest itself in obedience to the law of Yahweh through his love written on our hearts. That's the common thread throughout the Bible. It's God's love. He did everything. He does everything. He will do everything because of his love, okay? As bad as you hate to say it, there will be some people that you won't see in the kingdom, but they had a choice, didn't they? If we do what we're supposed to do and take it to them and introduce it to them and, they, and lay it out before them and they have choices and they decide that they don't want to have anything to do with it, what are we supposed to do? We can't force it on them. Does God force anything on us? No. Does he twist our arm? No. He lays everything out before us and he said, the choice is yours. Okay? We need to pray that we choose righteously, though. We need to pray that when we witness to others, that we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the words, the verbiage, the time, the place, and, and the instruments to, to reach those people. Amen? It's all about the Holy Ghost, okay? That concludes our review for our lesson for this week. Praise God. And before I sit down, I just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, Starting June 23rd, we are going to start a uh, process called Prophecy Pure and Simple. We are going to start on the 23rd prayerfully, okay? And we are going to journey through the books of Daniel and Revelation. The only thing you have to do is come prayerful and be ready to study. You won't need anything but your Bible, a highlighter, and a notepad. 
What we're trying to decide now is just exactly what format we're going to put it in, whether we're going to do it over the phone or whether we're going to do it via Zoom conference. Okay? Any questions concerning that? No? June 23rd, starting at 7 p.m., our teachers are getting ready. Okay? And all we got to do is open up our hearts and our minds. Reason we can never study this enough because people are asking, and people will continue to ask. All right. All right. Last but not least, <clears throat> we have a group of people that have been down on the corner of Fifteenth and Broadway for at least what eight or ten weeks now. Has it been, uh, Bishop? about eight or 10 weeks, okay? This coming Friday, we are going to start a thing called pop-up prayer. Nice and simple. Send your friends, send your family, send your enemies, okay? Send anybody that you want to. They come by that corner, they pop up, we gonna pray. Only question we gonna ask them is, do you have mustard seed faith? They got mustard seed faith, we praying. Huh? That's what our job is to do. We're there anyway every Friday giving away clothes. Amen? It's a blessing to our soul. We had a young lady that came through yesterday. We had about three or four boxes of clothes for kids. She took them all. She said, y'all are a blessing to my soul. Who are you? She said, I got five kids. She didn't look like a young lady that had five kids. She did not. She looked like an athlete. Am I telling the truth? Sister Dorothy, am I telling the truth? I'm, I'm telling the truth. She had five kids, but she said, y'all are a blessing. We've had other people. We had one man that came through there three or four times on the city bus. He did. One week, came through there three or four times. He came, left, came back, left, came. Sister Hayden, am I telling the truth? Left, came back, left, came back again, and then came back again, you know? But we need your help, and this is a total participation effort, and all we're asking you to do is if you have gently worn clothes that you want to get rid of in the spring cleaning season, praise God for yours, for what you've done. We're asking you to let us know we will come and get it. We will. Because people are in need of it. Okay? You'll be surprised. People are in need of it. We will come and get it. All you got to do is call us and let us know. All right? We especially need kids' clothes now. Because that young lady wiped us out. But as long as it's a blessing to her, and she remembered that the blessing came from the Lord, that's the most important thing. And oh, by the way, while we're on that corner, typically from like 9.30 to 10 o'clock to like 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you have somebody that's standing in the need of prayer, send them. We're going to pray. We're going to anoint. We're going to lay hands on. Okay? They pop up. We're going to pray. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do, okay? That is correct. We'll be moving around the city. We did. That's typically the way we plan it. So me and Elder one morning were inspired to go over to Tolleson Park. We had heard, my kids told me that there was, had been some shooting in Tolleson Park. So we went over to Tolleson Park and we sat there and we prayed. We did. Now, I don't know if anything else has gone on in Tolleson Park since that time, but I know we went over there and prayed. But it is our plan to go to City Hall. We're going to pop up. We're going to pray. Okay? A couple of scriptures. Pass out some literature. We're going to pray. We're going to go across the street to the courthouse. We're going to pop up. We're going to pray. We're going to Marquette Beach. We're going to pop up. We're going to pray. Okay? And if you have another location where you know 
that this type of ministry is absolutely necessary, let us know or meet us there. We're going to pop up. We're going to pray. All right? Any questions about that? Praise the Lord. Let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to transition into our next service. Father God, we thank you and praise you for what you have done, for what you're doing, and what you are going to do. We want to hear from you today, Lord. We do. We want to hear from you today. Use the pastor, because I know he's got a message for us. Use ministers and, and, our, and our people in song, because I know you're going to use them today, Lord. Bless us with your presence. Continue to bless us with your presence. But Holy Ghost, don't let us walk away the same way we walked in. Make us over again. Make us better. And then use us for your bidding. Bless this next service and all the participants on it. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. We pray and we thank you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have not exactly perfected how we start our service. That's why I'm looking up in the control room to see if I should start now so that it can coincide with uh, the presentation on the, uh, the live streaming. However, happy Sabbath. And I'm sure that everyone has had a blessed week this week. Or we pray to that end. And even if you haven't, your week can reach its apex today because we have come to present ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We're so thankful for everything that he does for us. Amen. And one of the things that we are eternally grateful for is what's printed in John 3, 16 and 17, which is our affirmation of faith. So if you would kindly stand and join with us those of you who are at, at home, and repeat with us our affirmation of faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now here's the key, because a lot of people don't believe this. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God 
for that. We can hold on to that. And if you believe it, claim it, and live it by faith, it will take you all the way to glory. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving this morning and into your courts by faith with praise. We thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us safely through another week. We present ourselves before you this morning and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that can feel your presence and will be receptive to the power of the Holy Spirit as we choose Jesus day by day and even moment by moment. Lord, bless your people this morning. Help us to lay down the mundane things of life and to look up to heaven and see Jesus high and lifted up. Bless us to that end, we pray in his most wonderful and powerful name. And we thank you, Lord, in the merciful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all of God's people said, amen and amen and amen. You may be seated. Morning, happy Sabbath. Because the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. 
help you to do what honors him the most. That's why you're saved. That's why you're saved. Oh, yes, you're saved. When the storm, when the storm, when the storm is raging, and the billow Today's story is called Payday at the Vineyard. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Boys worked together. Two hours later, they were done with the job. John's father was very pleased. He gave each boy some money to say thank you. John and Sam received the same pay, even though John had worked one hour more. John thought to himself, This is not fair. 
Then he remembered a story Jesus told about fairness. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. In Jesus' time, men would gather in the marketplace at six o'clock in the morning. There, they would wait for someone to come and hire them. One morning, a vineyard owner came looking for workers. At six o'clock, he hired some men. He agreed to pay them the usual pay for 12 hours of work. At nine o'clock, he came back to the marketplace. He saw men still standing around. Go work in my vineyard and I'll pay you what is right, he told them. At noon and at three o'clock, he hired more men. Again, at five o'clock in the afternoon, just one hour before quitting time, he did the same thing. At six o'clock in the evening, the landowner told his foreman to pay the workers. He should begin with those who were hired last and end with those who were hired first. First, the foreman paid those who had only worked an hour. He gave them a full day's pay. Then he paid those who worked for three hours. He gave them a full day's pay too. Those who were hired first began to smile. They were sure they would receive more. After all, they had worked longer and harder than the others. It would only be fair, wouldn't it? But when they received their pay, their smiles turned to frowns. They got the same pay as everyone else. Wait, they complained. Those men only worked an hour. You made them equal to us. We did most of the work and in the heat of the day, too. I'm not being unfair to you, said the landowner. You agreed to work for the usual pay for a day's work. That's what I'm paying you. I can do what I want with my money. Don't be jealous because I'm generous. Then Jesus said it again. The last will be first, and the first will be last. Do you like that story? Do you think it's fair? You may not. And that's the point Jesus was making. God does not treat us the way we deserve. God treats us much, much better than that. It's His grace that saves all of us, those who accept Him at the last minute and those who accept Him early. God doesn't have to save any of us. He does it because He loves us. Do you treat others in God's family the same way God has treated you? When someone is mean to you, do you treat them with love and kindness? Try to treat others as God treats us. In that way, you show that God is much, much better than simply fair. This podcast is read by Franita Buddy for Gracelink.net. Created and produced by Falvo Fowler. Post produced by Faith Toe at Studio El Piso. The theme music is by Clayton Kinney. For more information, please visit gracelink.net.
ask Sister Gillum to come and bring a song that would put us in the mood for an intercessory prayer. And who's better to lead us than Jesus Christ himself? It's now time for us to telephone the glory. Oh, what joy divine. I can feel the current moving on the line. The line is never busy. You can dial almost any time on that royal telephone. We have so many people that are sick and in need of prayer. Sister Kelly Tipton just gave me about Irving Bell over at the University uh, of Chicago in the hospital. He had a brain fracture, bleeding on the brain with multiple uh, con uh, concussions. And we're going to take him to the throne of grace. We're just so happy for the improvement of Elder Donnell Lamont Smith. And he's doing wonderful in therapy. We've been out to visit with him. And Elder Clement Irving, his wife asked me to come out to the hospital and then on him and pray with him. And after we did that on that Sunday, the next day, they got him up for therapy. And he was able to walk and use that left hand. And now they have moved him from the fourth floor down to full therapy because he's doing so good. Won't Jesus do it? He'll do it. If you just dial on the royal telephone. And Sister Alvina Crump is doing good. We've been keeping up with her. She's in full therapy. She had a stroke on her left side. And the Lord is healing. All you got to do is have saving faith. Not just normal faith, saving faith. There's 14 points on saving faith. I don't have time to deal, deal with that right now. But that's the kind of faith that Jesus hears and answers and he... Uh, accept our prayers with saving faith. That's the faith that's going to carry us to heaven. So at this time, all those that can kneel as far as possible, I need one of these microphones here. I'm going to get on my knees because I like to talk to Jesus when I'm kneeling in prayer. Thank the Lord. Our Father and our God, we're so thankful that you allowed us to sleep all last night and the angels watched over us. And you allowed us to see the dawning part of another beautiful Sabbath day. The first Sabbath day in the month of June. The fifth in the year of our Lord in 2021. And we want to say thank you. We thank you for how you kept us all night and watched over our family and our friends and our loved ones. And then you brought us out to the house of prayer. Well, you promised that you would meet us because you say this house shall be a house of prayer for all generations. Now, Father God, we ask and we are so thankful for all what you've already done. We thank you for, uh, for life, for food, for clothing, for shelter. We thank you, dear Lord, how when we call, we, you told us to ask, to believe, and to claim the promise. And we are doing that, Lord. And we thank you how you've answered in behalf of Donnell Lamont Smith, Clement Irving, and Sister Crump. We thank you, dear Lord, they're improving because you have laid your healing hand upon them. We thank you, dear Lord, for uh, answering prayer in behalf of right now. We are going down for Irving Bell. Over in the University of Chicago, you're already there. We don't have to tell you to go there. You're already there. Yes. We ask you to do what you do. And lay your healing hand on him that he might be fully restored according to your will. That he can come off the ventilator and that he will be able to breathe on his own. And that he will be restored fully. We ask you to remember the bereaved ones. Comfort the left lonesome spot in their heart. Remember the Vandenberg and the Carter family and the little lost of Cameron who uh, drowned in the, the little Calumet River. We ask you to comfort that family, be with them. We ask you to remember uh, one of our members here at MISPA and then she moved, to, for she come from Shiloh first and then to MISPA and then to Bron Brunswick. Mary Magdalene Mossy, a faithful servant of the Most High God. She went in on May the 18th and we ask you to comfort the left lonesome heart of her daughter, Adrian, 
and her granddaughter that she so faithfully attended and took care of her over in Park Forest, Illinois. Comfort that was hard, Lord. We look for the day there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. We ask you to remember uh, the, uh, um, all of those who have lost loved ones. Remember our little Caucasian lady right across the street. They're having a memorial service for her family right now in Griffith, Indiana. We ask you for the left lonesome spot for her, Lord, and her family. All of her children, Lord, and their challenge. We pray that they will be put in beautiful homes where someone can take care of them and, and do what is needed for them. Now, Father God, all of your servants are here before you this morning. We need a fresh baptism and a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to fill us and baptize us anew. And we need, you, we need to hear a word from the Lord this morning. We need fresh bread from on the table of our altars. We ask you to use Dr. Leroy Coleman. Let him down into the, uh, into the treasures of your book. From Genesis to Revelation that he might bring truths old and new. And from the love gift of the spirit of prophecy, Lord. We need you. So many people are doing so many things, Lord. We rebuke Satan. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we're getting relief from this coronavirus and you're being able to let us come out, Lord. But we're still being careful because we know that we have to be obedient to your will and your way. We ask you, dear Lord, to remember our children who are graduating, those will be seniors who will be graduating and coming out of school and going to the universities. Be with them and, and comfort their hearts, Lord. Let them, dear Lord, go and learn, but take you with them. They cannot do anything without you, Lord, that they might pray and they won't be caught up with the snares of this world. We ask you to save our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren because you said that you will remember the prayers of the mothers for their children when Micah stands up and at that time they may all be saved. We ask you, dear Lord, to comfort us and be with us throughout the remainder of this service. And as the music and the hymns are sung today, may they comfort our hearts and carry us into the heavenly place, in the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is and the Father is sitting on his raw blue throne. Be with us and keep us to this end. We thank you for hearing. We thank you for answering. And we must ask you to forgive us of our hidden sins of iniquity and our sins of omission and commission. In the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. We just ask that group to come back one more time and sing another verse of lead me, guide me along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. just got the news that the Ken Britt was on his way into the sanctuary uh, to uh, be with us this morning and he got the call that his niece just died so we just want to lift up a prayer Ella Gillum come on up here and pray for me this morning for over Ella Britt brother Britt that just lost his family his, his loved one and he's on his way to go to be with the family we just want to say a word of prayer for for the Britt family thank you Let's bow our heads. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are aware of the fact that nothing escapes your gaze and your view. You are aware of everything that goes on in the earth. 
but it is comforting to our own hearts when we petition the throne of grace in our own behalf and in behalf of those that we work with and love and who are members of our congregation. Lord, we pray that uh, you will dispatch the Holy Spirit to that situation, comfort the heart of Brother Britt, and that you can intervene in this particular case, Lord, and bring joy and gladness uh, to all of the family members in spite of this tragic event. Lord, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We are burdened down in this life as we live in the closing scenes of Earth's history. It only reinforces the fact that we have to be cemented in our relationship with you. Because this could happen to any one of us. We heard it this morning from Elder Cherry in the Sabbath school discussion, how that even when we go to sleep at night, we should cement our relationship with you. Because we don't know what will happen even in our next breath. So Lord, we don't like to mention this fact, but everything that happens, happens for a reason. Let your people be awake and in tune to what's happening in the earth and what's happening as the Holy Spirit is slowly being withdrawn from this earth. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to know you, to have faith in your word, and not only to have faith in it, but to live it. So if we should close our eyes in the sleep of death, or if we should have some type of debilitating illness, Lord, we can hold on to your unchanging hand because we know that you're just as close to us as our own breath in our body. Lord, thank you that we can call upon your most holy and righteous name and we ask that you would bring glory and honor in this situation. Bless that family. Bless the families in this place who are wrestling with many of the problems that are going on in the earth. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for keeping us during this pandemic. Lead us. May we hear your voice. Tell us what to do, how to live. And then, Lord, we can be careful to give you all the glory and honor that's due your most precious name. In the worthy name of Jesus, we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. God is going to show up. God is 
is going to show up. He's standing. He is standing by. There's healing. There's healing for your sorrow. Healing for your pain. Healing for your spirit. There's shelter from the rain. to be in the house of the Lord today. How about you? Come on, put your hands together and bless God. Bless him for all that he's done and all that he's doing. And there is healing for our souls. Even right now, even now as we prayed, he is comforting and strengthening the Brit family on their loss just this morning. As he has done for us for everything we needed. He has been there. Can I get a witness some? Amen. Bless the Lord at all times. His word says, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Yeah. We magnify God. We bless Him on this Sabbath day for health and strength and life 
We even thank him for the problems he gives us because it just makes him look better. Can I get a witness? Praise ye the Lord. Thank you for the good music for all those who come each Sabbath to make this work. Those who join online because we have a team that's been working of music, been working over a year. We can uh, watch our services virtually any place in the world. And we thank those of you who come faithfully to the sanctuary to join us to uh, let God see your face and give a hand clap and praise the Lord. We are still in the midst of COVID. It has not gone. I know too much. I see too much. I'm in the hospitals where patients have been dying, where nurses have collapsed and doctors have fainted. Not a story. And while there seems to be a relief, uh, we're still in COVID. And with the variants, we don't want to let our guards down. So please keep that in mind. Too many stories of churches, be honest with you, where somebody was exposed, came out, and wasn't, didn't keep themselves, came and many got it. Too many stories, even in the Chicago area. And so we as a people who are much more susceptible to get it, and have a difficult time when we do get it, got to be careful. So I, I hear the calls to open up church and everything and would love to do that, uh, but we still got to be careful. So we're not opened up yet and that time will come sometime. But you know, it's just my hunch that since this COVID pandemic, nothing will ever be the same again. And then the question is, did we want everything to be the same? It's like when certain political leaders say, let's go back to old America. Did you really want to go back to old America? Limited electricity, unsanitary outdoor toilets, women can't vote and work, slaves run. Did you really want to go back to old America? It wasn't that great. But God is leading us forward to remember and to consider that he is with us on this journey. It's been quite a week for our family. We've, we've had good friends who've had tragedies in their lives all the way from last Sunday to now. And so it's been news after news. In fact, one of our God sends, Marcel, who is just a little younger than our uh, youngest, Kareeb, uh, he, he died this week. And so the service is this coming week. It's a young man in his early 20s, just died in his sleep. Suffering is all over, but we thank God that he is good. Is that right? Praise God for our supportive prayers and for our comforting words to each other and for uh, reminding ourselves that God is still on the throne. I want to just remind us as a church family of a couple of things. We are so grateful for your faithfulness, faithful giving through this pandemic. We... Um, um, God has just blessed us financially that our church is not lacking anything, even though times are harder. Amazing how God works. He can use difficult things to bring out our faithfulness. Don't, we want to remind, uh, I think our board members know there's a board meeting tomorrow morning, so keep that in mind. Look out for the details on that. Check with us if you don't have all the details on that. Uh, we have communion coming up in July, so we didn't forget. Imagine it's already June. We just started this year, looked like a few days ago, and it's already June, so keep that in mind. Um, our family has started a 21-day fast and prayer, so we already started. So we just invited the church family to join us for a 14-day, and we're looking to start that. I think that's going to show up in our newsletter starting that on uh, next Sabbath, the 12th, all the way through, through, I believe, the 26th. So you'll see more specifics on that. Uh, why fast and pray? Well, because it's good for us. It's good for your health. Ask me again, why fast and pray? Because Jesus says so. Why fast and pray? Because he says often, call a fast. Why? Because Jesus did so himself. Why? Because there have never been a more difficult time in the history of the planet. And part of our Christian responsibility and service is to intercede. 
Where we can't go, we can pray and our prayers will send angels and get that and take a difference. Can I get a witness? As if there was not enough problems in your family, that's why we need to fast and pray. As if there's not mental, emotional issues in your life, that's why I just sat on a council meeting this week in which uh, uh, medical and psychological experts and clergy and, and community leaders are just trying to grapple because across America and the planet, more than ever, teenage suicide. So teens knew how to text, but they don't know how to cope in a pandemic. You realize our younger generation have little skills because everything they do is just a text or electronic message. They have much more interpersonal survival skills than we had. And we had a hard time. Why fast and pray? You want me to go on? <laughs> if you don't know why, then that's why you ought to fast and pray. So we're encouraging everyone to take the next 13 days for our church family. If you list online, you're welcome to join. And so the question always, well, what are we going to do? Well, uh, it's a season of fasting and pray. You choose the amount of days you want to fast. When? Select your prayer partner. Uh, really, what is fasting and prayer? Well, I, I've learned over the years to summarize it. It's not so much, it's not really about absence of food. Even though that can be a helpful part. But to me, fasting and praying is, is choosing to move things out of your vision, out of your life, off the plate, so you can spend more time feasting on God. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let me talk to this side here. Fast and prayer is really a call to feast on God. You're more alert. You're, you're more conversation with Him at work. Co-workers might think you lost your mind. That's okay. They already lost yours. You just got your right mind. So just go ahead and talk to God and make it sound like yourself. So take some time every day. You can choose your fast. You can fast from television, from media, from social media. You can fast from sugar, candy. You can fast from food. You, you, you can do a Daniel fast, which is really not a fast. It's just a more healthy lifestyle. It's a good time during this time to just eat fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. And you know, it's, it's, so you, you choose your fast. Pastor's not going to tell you that. But whatever you do, take more time to feed on God's word and to feast on God's heart. Is that right? You got it? It's simple enough. So don't ask me. Well, just you, you can start at 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. We're not going to go with that. A season of a lot of prayer and fasting. Got it? That's it. And you can choose all your specifics in that way. That makes it simple for everybody. Because many people have... Uh, dietary conditions, all kind of things. So when we say fast, uh, this pastor is not focusing on the absence of food. But he's focusing on the eating of spiritual food with our Heavenly Father each day. That makes sense? So keep that in mind and we just want to encourage each other on that. And uh, you'll see more information coming on that. Can I get a witness, somebody? Uh, I'm not going to ask you, has God been good? Because he has. I'm just going to ask you, did you realize how good God has been? <laughs> and so, the wonderful words of the song said, uh, Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Another song says, Oh, day of rest and what? Gladness. So if somebody look at you, they shouldn't see a sadness. They should see a glad Christian. Can I get a witness, somebody? Praise ye the Lord. So glad you're here today as uh, we open God's words. Know he's going to open our hearts and our minds. And I want, to, uh, I want to invite your intellect and your imagination to join me uh, in our scripture for today. 2 Samuel the ninth chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Bring your mind and your heart there. Second Samuel, the ninth chapter, beginning at about verse 1 through, I think we're going down through about verse 7. Uh, it's on the screen, but it's always good if you pull it up on your own phone or iPad or so. Second Samuel, uh, the ninth chapter, 1 through 7. I'm going to wait till you arrive there, give you a moment here for the word of the Lord. And while we look at that, if you just stand with me as we read those few verses, as we honor God's word. And if you are joining online, you're welcome to stand for wherever location you are. 
as we read God's word. The word of God says, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba, or Ziba. They summoned him to appear before King David, and David asked him, Are you Ziba at your service? He replied. Word of God says, Then the king asked, Is there one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lobadar. The word of God says, so, so it is that King David had him brought from Lobadar, from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. When Mephibotheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down and paid him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Do not be what? David said to him, do not be what? For I will surely show kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you the land that has belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat where? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your true and precious promises. Speak to our hearts, remind us of what the king said, what the king asked for, and what the king promised. Oh God, and when all is said and done, we pray that we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When I was growing up, maybe like many of you, we played the game, Simon Says. And pretty much in the game, the winner is the one who's good to clearly wait to know whether that's what Simon said or somebody just said it. And so Simon says, turn to the right. And then somebody said, well, sit down. Some people just sat down. Simon didn't say it. Simon says, reminds me of how important it is what God says. And as we mentioned last week, we're starting this series on focusing on the promises of God. Now, let me just say right up, because I know how Bible students' mind work. It says, well, pastor, God said he, he promises if. Well, sure. Many of the promises of God's word are conditional. But don't let the condition rob you of the power of the promise. <laughs> the condition is just the key that you've been offered to put the key in and turn the door. Many of us can focus so much on the condition. And there are many promises. God didn't ask anybody anytime. He didn't limit it to anyone. In fact, one of the strangest ones that many Christians look over, he just says in Joel, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. He didn't say righteous, unrighteous. Other place in the Bible, it says other things. Sometimes he promises this and that. All I know, I love to hear what God promises. How about you? <laughs> and what's amazing is that he promises people who are not worthy. He promised a thief on the cross, Lorraine, who was being killed and executed for horrible crimes. I don't know if the man had a chance to recompense or repent or anything. He was dying on the cross. He said, surely, I say to you, because you asked, I tell you today, you will be in paradise with me, right? He didn't have to get baptized. I'm sorry, church folk. His name didn't come to the board for okay for his Bible studies. Considered. You know, some of the things we put up are good church things because we got to manage what we do. But they're not a requirement of heaven. Sorry to burst your bubble. They asked 
Jailer asked, I think it was Peter, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Believe and be baptized. And some people don't get a chance to be baptized. But their hearts get baptized, right? So, so I, I want us to lead us down. How, how, how amazing. So, so mentally understand, come with your mind. And there are many promises where God said, if you do my will, if you do this and do that, and they are good, but it's still a promise. <laughs> right. we, know, we know that our Bibles are, are, are laden with many promises. For example, Deuteronomy 28. He said, now it comes to pass, if you obey me diligently. He said, I'm going to do such and such. And he says, if you don't, you're going to get these things which just are a consequence of the natural evil of your world, of yourself. But he goes on and many don't read how much he promises to bless us. He says in Deuteronomy 28, he's, he said, I'm going to bless you when you come in and you go out. It's so abundant, you forgot the if. You said, I, I, what can I do to receive these promises? Are you with me? <laughs> and then he promises Adam and Eve, who messed up so bad, without their permission, he says, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you a savior that will crush the head of the serpent. And that Genesis promise is the first prophetic promise that the savior would come and turn things around. Wow. You didn't hear a long apology or any at all from Adam and Eve. All right. So what I want us to hear that the world needs to hear from Christians. I want to package a message for believers that I want you to absorb in your heart so you can go down and shout around Gary or wherever you're watching from to say, I found bread. Is that what salvation is? One sinner who found bread going and telling the others, I found it. So I want us to hear these words. Because many times as believers, our Bibles from Genesis filled with rum, we, we pour water on it by adding so many dimensions to it. No, it's just straight up the street right there. You don't have to go all the way around and take off your shoes and watch it. I, I was at the airport some weeks ago and what have you and, 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 and you know, went through the drive, ready to take off my belt and, and, and unlace my shoe. And they're like, no, 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 on this machine, you, you just keep everything on. You don't have to take out your laptop. Just, I said, really? I said, you sure? And the lady behind me said, what did he say? And the whole chorus of us that early morning is like, did he say we don't have to? He said, no, just walk right through. We got a new machine. I said, can you, have, can you line me up to this machine every time I go through? <laughs> Jesus, God in his word, wants to make salvation accessible more than any country or county or city wants the vaccine accessible. If there's a time you have to call up, sign up online. Uh, a few African American doctors and Hispanic have found out. They've told the governments and counties to say, listen, uh, don't have the people come to where you have the vaccine. Take the vaccine to where they live. And they did that early. As soon as they did that, the numbers of minority went up. So we are God's salvation vaccine agents to get the supply of God's promises and take it to where the people live. And once you take it to where they live, I guarantee you they'll come to your church or to your home or want to know what they believe. But a lot of times we, we, we try all kinds of things. So I just want us to receive this message for our heart from the word. And pass it on to somebody. Is that a plan? Is that a plan? All right. Through the Bible, as we said, there's so many promises. Promises all over. And all of us have many favorites. It says here, it says, God always keeps his promises. For the Son of God, Jesus, has been preached among us. For all the promises of God in him are amen, yea and nay, to the glory of God. 
Uh, Psalm 89 says, God never takes back or changes what he promised. Once his word goes forth, we hold him to it. Not hostage, but we say, Lord, you promise, as children say. And so Psalm 89 says, no, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back the word that I've said. Joshua 23 said, you know with all your heart and soul that no one, not one of all these good promises of the Lord have failed. You know it. You heard it, you see. They've not failed. So use them. Hold on to them. We have promises of eternal life. And this he has promised, 1 John 2. He's promised us that we shall receive eternal life. And the list goes on. What is impossible with men is possible with God. That's a promise, no condition. And then he says as we read every morning here, uh, as we rather say it together, declare it together, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, a promise that has already been fulfilled, that whosoever, don't get me started on the whosoever. <laughs> Chili. To Alaska, Antarctica, to the North Pole, Australia, to Austin, Texas. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. And the Bible is filled with the promises of God. I will give you a new heart, he says. I will give you new and right desires. Chew on that promise. And during this time of fasting and prayer, a great exercise is, is not just to read and study the Bible, because we do a lot of that, but how about just bathing in the Word, jumping in it, let it wash you. Just read the promises. Just pull them out and mark. Mark new promises in your Bible you have not marked. Pro read them, say them, and how about memorize them? Because you'll need them. Can I get a witness, somebody? And, and they are wonderful. It, it, it says, he promises in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Meaning, the Spirit of God who comes in you will give you the characteristics of God, which are the fruit of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are the activity, the actions, the work of God that he promises to give us. And the list goes on and on. And one of my favorite, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he... Gave is only that whosoever believeth in him. Yeah. And then he comes back and he talks about John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. In the Bible, it takes the word promises to a deeper level. In much of the Old Testament, it's not just called promise. It's called a covenant. And a covenant is ratified with shedding of blood. So when a covenant is made by two kings or between a God and a human being, uh, many times, sad enough, an uh, animal would be sacrificed, cut in half, one side on this side, the other, and the two people have to walk on both sides of the sacrificed animal, representing that if you blow the covenant, you will be the same as the animal sacrificed see that's how uh, how big how how deep how anchored the covenant of God so when God made a covenant with with Adam and Eve and with Abraham and with 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 Israel uh, it is forever and we get the benefits of the covenant and so the covenant or his promises that goes on and on to remind us how amazing God is to pull off these great things in our lives for us. So I want to make a parallel here. Covenant promises. So in this story that we read, amazing, David has become king. Saul, David's enemy, Jonathan, Saul's son, David's best friend, made a covenant. They made a covenant together. That covenant is, 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 is found in 1 Samuel. And now we're in 2 Samuel. So in 1 Samuel, between chapter 12 and 15, David makes a covenant with Jonathan. He says, uh, uh, as we both live, I will look out for your generations. Now, in 2 Samuel 9, David fulfills the covenant. He's been king for a little while. He looks around. He says, okay, because typically in those days, when, when the 
previous king died, they would search out to kill the former king's family. So none of them would rise up and try to regain the throne or continue to become. <laughs> in this case, when the word got out that Saul was killed in battle and Jonathan, his family was taken to hiding. And while the maid was running with Jonathan's son, the, five -year the son who was about five that age, the worker says, fell and his legs were broken and for the rest of his life, he was disabled. David now is reigning as king and, and, and it's silent in terms of uh, the, 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 the generations of Saul. So as he's getting his kingdom together, he said, hey, listen, I need to find a member of the household of Saul because I want to be kind to my enemies. That will rock your boat, church folk. Find the children and the friends and the families of your enemies and do good to them. So, so David now calls on Saul's administrative assistant. He said, listen, come here. Is there anybody alive from the household of Saul? He didn't even say Jonathan. He said, well, yeah, yeah. He said, well, bring him. So the record says, he said, well, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a son of Jonathan. Mephibosheth, he is, he's all the way down in Lobar and, and, and actually he said, oh yeah, Jonathan has a disabled son. King Saul says, when you look in the Hebrew, I didn't ask you about his disability. I asked you who he was. Church folk are good at pointing out disabilities and problems. We're good at labeling people with their problems as if we don't have one. Hmm. Hmm. So I said, no, 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 I, I don't know his disability. That doesn't deter my, my, my promise to him or my plans for him. I don't care whether he's disabled. I didn't ask you that. Uh, where is he? Bring him here. So, so Ziba, administrative assistant of Saul, reaches down, go low bar. They bring up Jonathan's disabled son. And in the picture, we don't know how it is, but he's a grown man now. Uh, um, he's disabled. I don't know if he's walking on canes like that, but that's just a depiction. He is fully disabled. And, uh, but here it is. If David can keep the covenant to Jonathan without Jonathan's son even qualifying, how much more God keeps his covenant with Adam and Eve, Abraham, Israel, to us. And many times we ask, what qualifies us? God said, because I feel like it. Because you want to know you qualified. That means you want to know your promotion is self-promotion or it's self-identification or it's classism. Well, I'm better. I'm this. I've been at the church longer. I took Bible studies for five years instead of six months. Shame enough you had to take it for five years before you joined the church. And the Bible is filled of people. They didn't study. I mean, it, it, it just even showed. Ethiopian eunuch said, here's the water. What prevents me? Brother said, hey, do you believe? I believe. Pap died. Boom. Now, I'm not saying it all has to happen that way. But many times, God has promises and things he wants to bless us. And we pour water on it. Well, I've been in the church long enough. Well, my mama and daddy. Uh, well, I'm disabled. Well, I've, I've, I've got heart issues. Ziba, bring him. And this story that is often untold, packed away where David now shows the heart of David that is far from a perfect man. But maybe we have problems with David because he reminds us too much of us. David says, bring him. So this story now displays through David's actions and how he carries out. He shows the character of God. That's what we're to do. We and how we deal with people, we, we look out for the unfortunate. We are displaying the character of God. Yeah. I'm coming back to it, right? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and many times the best truth we can teach is showing the heart of God. Because some of us aren't good teachers. We complicate the truth. 
So God says, I'm going to give you my spirit. Be kind to your enemies. David shows it, and the record says they brought him in, and, and the word of God says, uh, uh, now, as we're all conditioned, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, falls down on this David. And, 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 and David, first of all, said, do not be afraid. Because guess what? Don't overlook, even though time has gone by, this son of Jonathan, I call him Meph, is probably on his way in wondering, because that was a custom, how the king is going to kill him. Not so much if, because that was a custom. Okay, they found me. I'm the next in line to Jonathan, who should have been heir to the throne. I'm next in line. I'm alive, so I'm now a threat to David. Man's going to bring me in. What's he going to do? Throw me to the lions, burn me at the stake, execute me, behead me. What is he going to do? David said, do not be afraid. I brought you here for a bigger promise than you. The promises of God are bigger than your actions. They came before you were born, and they will be fulfilled before you die. They're bigger than you. God so loved the world. That's so much bigger than us. God said, I don't care how fool you want to act. I want to save you. I know there are problems in their lives and there are things I've asked you to do. But bigger than that is God's amazing plan. Got it? That's what we want to communicate to people. We don't want to find ways to exclude them. Did you know that there was a time, even within certain Christian churches, that just like when we walk in now, we got to take a temperature screen and ask the questions that believers coming to church had to pass a list. Did you gamble this week? Did you cheat this week? Did you drink this week? Did you do drugs this week? Before they were allowed to come into churches. And even before they could answer that, if you were a person of color, the question wouldn't have been asked. You were just sent the other way. So we would disqualify whom God qualified by the size of his promise. I'm deep into the generation of Christians, so in my mind, my mind is programmed to do and get and Jesus said you can't do enough to get what I have to give you just have to receive that you're my child and I love you enough it's hard to get over that minister Fred because we are programmed in what we've been taught that do and and there's some of that that is good we develop and we grow but when it comes to salvation God sent his son is so much bigger than the little mess we do that we think is going to disqualify. This story represents as, as, as uh, Meph, Jonathan's son, comes and he said, David says, do not be afraid, verse 7, for I will show you kindness for your father, Jonathan's sake. I will then restore to you the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table. I don't have time to tell you all that this applies. Now keep in mind now, if Jonathan was alive, he would have been king, not David. But God's purpose was for David to be king. So even if Jonathan was not David's friend, Jonathan couldn't unwant what God's plan was. That's where Jacob messed up. Because even though Esau was the oldest son, all he had to do was stand on the promise and let God work it out. God could have done it a thousand ways. He could have blessed Esau. Esau could have been disabled. He could have died. Esau could have even passed on. said, listen, God has spoken to me. Jacob, I'm going to pass on the birthright to you. We're always trying to help God out and we usually mess it up for him or do a detour. And God says, as David says to Jonathan, even though your father is dead, I'm not going to kill you. That's mercy. Now grace comes along and said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to save you. But I'm not just going to save you to leave you in Dobadar just to die. I'm now going to bring you to the palace even though you don't deserve it. Because you're a grandchild of the wicked Saul. I'm going to bring you to my table. So David now risks bringing a, 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 a 
possible candidate to dethrone him. David brings him into the house. He offers him land that would have belonged to Jonathan's, Jonathan's generations anyhow. He said, I'm going to restore to you what came to me because I'm king. I'm going to share it to you. The same thing happened with Joseph in Egypt. The Pharaoh at that time said, hey, Joseph, take the best land and give to your people. That's how the children of Israel went to Egypt in the first place. And then another Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. So David says to the broken soul and body of Mephibosheth, he says, I'm restoring you to the palace where you belong. It has nothing to do with you. It deals with my covenant with your father is bigger than you. So it's going to bless you. Then David says, you will sit at my table. When the Hebrew word implies, it doesn't say it in the text, but implies I'm going to share my throne with you. See, I, 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 could, I could bring out like five or ten other stories with this, but we're just going to peel this and go a little deeper. All right? Because so much of us is here. See, a lot of times when God calls to you to bless you, He's not calling you to bless you. He's calling you to be a channel of blessing. This. Ziba, come here. I'm not going to bless you, but I want you to find somebody who needs my blessing. Yeah. Tell me about Ziba. You want to know about Ziba? So he calls him and he offers to give him a place at the table. Well, when he does that, that blows this young man's mind. And he said, what? He said, I'm just a dog not deserving of your crumbs. Because a lot of times when God blesses us, abundantly we don't feel like we deserve it just think about that we don't feel like we deserve it I'm gonna stay close to the mic because the other one's not on he gives us the opportunity then to know that he calls us because he's got something better in mind for us than we could even pray for Mephibosheth would not have even imagined that he would have a seat of the table. Now, I want to move on to the parallel of the Nash 1 to this. And that is that what God promised us from generations, specifically Joel chapter 3, I'll pour out my spirit on my people. What God promised us is so much bigger than who we are. Are you with me? David's got it. He's cool. It's so much bigger than who we are. And when you go back and read Joel, it calls God's people uh, uh, to come together and fast and pray for the revival. And God punishes them and he promises them and he punishes them and he promises them. And his promises never go astray. But many times their reception to his promise is what blocks it. There's so much in this text. How much are we? Thanks, David. How much are we like? How much are we like David? Can God trust us to be kind to people who are our enemies? Who are our enemies? Who did us clear wrong? Can he trust us with that? Can God trust us with people around us that we don't believe deserve this beautiful, nice church. They're unkept, they're unshaved, they're smelly. Can God trust us to minister to them? Can God trust us to pass on his promises that are for others more than us, that we receive that we want to share with others? Or do we think it's just for Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Can God trust us? To bring others to the table. We as people of color are now begging to come to the table of justice and equity. I'm still amazed that I've just talked with people and family and co-workers as to how, how still women's pay and job opportunities are so, still so different than for men. Still. 
2021, still not so. I'm still amazed that God, that, that our world is so opposite to God in terms of how we treat each other, even in the church. Wow. But this story reminds us that God's promises are bigger, more than we can contain. So it just makes sense to share it. It's like if you got an unlimited supply of money, you can't even outlive it. It just makes sense to share it. It's like if you have opportunities, just makes sense to share it. It just makes sense to make sure that you share it and share it with others and, and, and make sure that they're on board, that they know that God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. Not according whether you're worthy or not, but according to his riches. And you see that over and over again. Riches in Christ Jesus is never your qualifications. Most of the times it's because of God's great love in Christ Jesus. Uh, it says here, you therefore, as David says, ah, uh, Meph, let me tell you what's happening. I'm going to give you a seat at the table. You and your sons and your servants uh, uh, are welcome here. You are at the table. As from Mephibosheth said to the king, he shall eat at my table like one of my sons. Now look at this. The disabled portion of him when he's at the table is covered up. <laughs> Just thought I'd drop that on you. When you're at the table, you can't see your disability. Once he's at the table, it's equal from the king to everybody. They're at a joint family table. And that's part of what the table represents. That's what church should represent. Not a place to continue to go back and forth and fight and, and argue and what have you. But, but that we see and we look for a place to bring everybody to the table. Because when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Can I get a witness, somebody? Well, just as, as David calls this son of Jonathan to the table, Jesus said to the disciples, I know you're not worthy, you're just fussing among yourselves like regular brothers in the family, always squabbling about something. But he said, I died, I rose, I just want to bring you back. And he tells them, uh, we, 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 we see that conversation in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus said to the disciples, we looked at it last week, he said, I'm about to go. And of course, they asked him, they said, you know, uh, again, wanted to know the signs. When is it? He said, no one knows exactly when the Father's coming. Nobody knows. Not even me. He said, really? You don't need any more signs. It's not, your purpose is to be ready. The exact time is none of your business. Here's your business. To get ready to receive the promise of the Spirit. Wow. Now, Jesus calls us to the table, like David called Mephibosheth. And he said, I want to give you my spirit. Now, note, as we said last week, the spirit of God is not so much something God gives you. The spirit of God is God himself. The Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the spirit. So the spirit is not just some come a phone charger, battery charger that I have to plug me up when I become a re-Christian. The Spirit is God taking over my life, leading in every way. And God promised all the way back, I'm going to pour out my Spirit. My sons and daughters, our grandchildren, great. Even at many places, when Peter speaks the book of Acts, he said, he said, God's Spirit would fall upon all of you. So it's coming. It's a big. And then in Acts, he said, in not many days from now. Acts 1, not many days from now. I'm going to give you my spirit. Jesus assembled to them. He said, go and wait for the promise. He said, just go, come together, pray together, wait for it, and it will change your life. And of course, we know what happens. They gathered together, they prayed, and there in the upper room, everybody died to self. They died to their own preferences. They put it aside. They died to themselves, and the spirit of God came and took over their lives. God has searched out each and every one of us. None of us are worthy. Not our time in church, not our position in church, not our pedigree, nothing, not our heritage, none of us. He said, I call you. Come. 
And the disciples represent us. They're a really rugged group, very mixed. But they're very churched. But they had to unchurch to become spirit-filled. <laughs> oh, there you go. You had to shake off some of those practices that got in the way. Uh, Jesus says, I have plans for you to fill you with my spirit. I want to leave you with seven plans as you're praying. You know what to do with it? Pray it to him. He's got to do it. He said it. So his word says, all my wants are met in Jesus. Psalm 23. Summarize. All my wants are met in Jesus. A second group of promises. Jehovah Jireh, Philippians 4. My God shall supply all my needs. Wow. Ephesians 2. I am receiving God's unlimited, immeasurable, surpassing greatness of his favor. Ephesians 2.10, I am God's handiwork made to do his amazing works of greatness as he promised and prophesied. Next, I am doing all things as God gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. Uh, 2 Peter 2, I am a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a holy nation, and a prized people. I am, Psalm 23, confident that God's greatness and mercy will be guide for my life until I live with him forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for your promises. Oh God, we ask that you would not only remind us of your promises, but show us how to accept them, how to pray them, how to live in the abundance of them. Oh God, magnify yourself and your word in us and through us. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we honor you. Because you have poured out your exceeding great and precious promises on us. In this season of prayer and fasting and focusing on you. Oh God, you promise where two or three are gathered in your name. <laughs> where we touch and agree heaven will move on our behalf. Oh God, you promised us that when we live in a world of COVID, we didn't even know what happened, but your promise said you'll supply all our needs, whether it's pre-COVID, during COVID, or post-COVID. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you know the week we've had, all the challenges in our families and in our lives, so we ask, oh God, that you would bless us abundantly. And that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing on us. It would blow our minds. We would not have room enough to receive it. We thank you. We praise you. We bless you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And amen. Thank you for coming to worship with us. Joining us online here in the sanctuary. Shabbat Shalom. Peace be unto you.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. 